Balls. It's 8 o'clock. Good morning. This is Northern Light for Wednesday, December 13th. I'm Monica Sandresky. And I'm Todd Moe. New York State's High Court has ruled that congressional districts in New York can be redrawn again for the 2024 elections. More details ahead. Last summer, a Canadian environmentalist hiked 350 miles from the Adirondacks to Algonquin Park in the footsteps of a famous moose who did the same. It underlines just how important it is for animals to be able to roam. You know, we create protected areas. We say, okay, here's the space for animals, but we forget that they will not stay in those protected areas. They will wander. Also, we'll talk with the artist creating the clothesline project at the Wild Center in Tupper Lake. Brenda Baker is collecting clothing from local farmers that will help illustrate our connection to the land and local food. It's probably the easiest thing you can possibly do to helping prevent a warming climate is hanging your clothes to dry. It's a simple practice that everyone can do. All of that and more is coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by Mountain Orthotic and Prosthetic Services, a full-service practice committed to providing care for patients of all ages with offices in Lake Placid, Plattsburgh, and Malone. Details and referrals at mountainonp.com. And by Blue Seed Studios, a multidisciplinary arts center featuring classes for adults and youth, concerts, art exhibits, and more. BLUseedstudios.org. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. New York State's High Court has ruled that congressional districts in New York that were reconfigured for the 2022 elections can be redrawn again for next year's elections. Karen DeWitt reports. The court ruled in a 4-3 to three decision that the state's Independent Redistricting Commission must be given another chance to redraw the state's congressional districts for the 2024 elections. In the opinion, recently appointed Chief Judge Rowan Wilson writes that indisputably the Constitution requires the commission to deliver a second set of maps. Wilson writes the people of New York are entitled to the process set out in the Constitution for which they voted. The redistricting process process in New York was revised in a constitutional amendment approved by voters in 2014. The ruling is expected to have an impact on the fight for control of the U.S. House. In 2022, the redistricting commission gridlocked. New districts were then drawn by Democrats who controlled the state Senate and Assembly. Those lines were later determined by the high court to be unconstitutionally gerrymandered, and a special master was appointed to redraw the districts. The Court of Appeals that year also found that the legislature should have given the Independent Redistricting Commission a second chance to redraw the maps as required under the state's constitution, but they didn't. In the elections that November, four Democratic House seats flipped to Republicans and helped contribute to the Democrats' loss of party control of the House. Critics blamed the Democrats in the state legislature who drew the maps for overreaching. The redistricting commission will now reconvene. They have until February 28th to submit new maps. If the five Democrats and five Republicans on the panel once again cannot agree on a single set of maps, then Democrats who lead the legislature will be allowed to intervene and draw the maps themselves. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt. A man has died and another has life-threatening injuries after a pickup truck hit an Amish buggy in the St. Lawrence County town of Oswegatchie Monday morning. The Watertown Daily Times reports the truck driver, Clark Zanker, didn't see the buggy when he struck it from behind on Route 812. 21-year-old Abraham Shetler was pronounced dead at the scene. 19-year-old Joseph Yoder was taken to Upstate University Hospital in Syracuse. State police are investigating the incident. 
Watertown officials have hired a new city manager. Eric Wegner will take over as city manager at the end of December. He's a retired colonel and has served as the deputy to the garrison commander at Fort Drum for the past eight years. In the job, he manages the day-to-day base operations and oversees 1,300 employees. According to the city, Wegner has helped the city on many issues, including its recent water main emergency. Wegner will replace Kenneth Mix, who announced in September that he would resign at the end of the year. The Canton Potsdam area was a buzz Monday afternoon after a minor earthquake rumbled through. People who experienced it can report what uh, what they felt to federal earthquake officials. Catherine Wheeler reports those surveys can offer scientists a lot of important information. The U.S. Geological Survey tracks earthquakes around the world. It picked up Monday's 2.8 magnitude earthquake about five miles outside of Canton. The USGS website also has a feature so you can report what the earthquake felt like to you. Did you feel it as an interesting crowdsourcing citizen science project? That's Alexander Stewart. He's an associate professor of geology at St. Lawrence University. Stewart says the North Country has a special connection to the survey. It was developed by David Wald, a geologist who graduated from St. Lawrence in 1984. He developed this program right at the forefront of Internet. Internet ability, capability, access, right? Where they thought of an idea, how can we get people to respond to their experiences, in this case, earthquakes? Stewart says the survey measures shaking intensity, or how people are interpreting the earthquake through their senses. You can fill out a series of questions online. Did you feel it? Where were you? Were you awake? Were you asleep on the first floor, second floor, third floor? Did things fall off the shelves? Since Monday's minor earthquake, nearly 280 responses have been recorded through the Did You Feel It survey. Most of them are centered around Canton and Potsdam. Someone made a report east of Fort Drum, and there's one south near Utica. Stewart says he didn't feel the earthquake at his house in Morristown, about 45 minutes from Canton, but he still filled out the survey. He says knowing where the earthquake wasn't felt is just as important. Most importantly is it's a repository for how particular magnitude earthquakes in a particular region impact the human environment. The more that information you have, the more you're able to plan, the more you're able to determine what can be built where and how to prepare for future events and future probabilities. Stewart says geologists and communities can use this data when they're planning to see how earthquakes could affect certain buildings or structures. Catherine Wheeler, North Country Public Radio. Listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It's eight minutes past eight. Good morning. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. Just ahead, artist Brenda Baker wants your old farm clothing for a community art installation next summer in Tupper Lake. We'll tell you more about the clothesline project at the Wild Center coming up in just a few minutes. At NCPR, we know you want facts, relevance, and understanding that comes from real journalism, the kind you find every day right here. Listeners just like you make that possible through your financial support. Consider all the times you've turned to NCPR this year and make a year-end contribution today at ncpr.org slash give. And thank you so much for your support. Music by Scott Shipley in Canton. Northern Light is supported by St. Lawrence Health, whose affiliation with Rochester Regional Health means more patient access to specialty care, stlawrencehealthsystem.org. And by St. Lawrence Nurseries, accepting orders now through April 12th for cold-hardy fruits and nut trees. Details at slngrow.com.
In 1998, researchers at SUNY ESF radio collared a four, a 700-pound female moose and released her into the woods, and they named her Alice. Two years later, Alice the moose began an epic 350-mile journey northwest through the Adirondacks across St. Lawrence Valley farmland to Ontario's Algonquin Provincial Park. Alice the Moose inspired the creation of a not-for-profit, the Algonquin to Adirondacks Collaborative, dedicated to preserving the corridor that she traveled. Last summer, she also inspired a Canadian environmentalist to walk in her footsteps. Jamie Findlay, a storyteller and grant writer for the conservation group Nature Canada, hiked the complete A2A trail. In the new issue of Adirondack Life magazine, he talks about his adventure with David Summerstein, and here's part of that conversation. What was so special about Alice the Moose? Uh, she walked out of Adirondack Park. She swam the St. Lawrence River. She crossed a number of roads, including Highway 401, which is a huge four-lane highway, to make it to Algonquin Park. So that kind of shows, you know, determination. Um, and it underlines just how important it is for animals to be able to roam. We forget but, you know, we create protected areas. We say, okay, here's the space for animals, but we forget that they will not stay in those protected areas. They will wander. And mammals, big mammals, often will wander hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. So Alice herself inspired me. The idea of corridor, of a travel route, a wild way for animals, um, inspired me because I don't think it's that concept is not so well known as you know, parks and protected areas. Um, And of course, it's going to become more uh, ecological corridors, travel routes are going to become more and more important as the climate changes because populations of animals will need to shift their ranges. What was a challenge that you encountered that maybe Alice the Moose didn't find such a challenge and vice versa? Okay, well, that's a that's a great question. Um, we didn't have to swim the St. Lawrence. <laughs> and we wanted to, but we were advised against it. Um, Alice the Moose had to deal with roads, and she dealt with them successfully. Uh, but she basically crossed them, right, and to get to uh, more favorable um, travel areas. And but we um, we walked them, like we we walked the the road shoulders and. Uh, walking with heavy packs on paved road, it, that wore me down. Um, we had to stick to the roads. I mean, that brought a few adventures as well. For example, we got a ride with an Amish uh, farmer in a horse and buggy uh, at one point, uh, which Alice uh, would never have done. So you can't, you know, our, our experience can't mimic an animal's experience. But I think you, you get a sense of what it's like to be an animal traveling. It really occurred to me, you know, to ask, how much you were able to get into Alice the Moose's head as you're, you know, in mind state as you were, you know, doing this. Alice was always there in our minds. We were always, we told people about Alice whenever we talked about the trek. And when we came to, <laughs> when we came to likely looking wetlands um, all through the trek, we would call Alice. We would see if there were moose there and we would call her um, and uh, we, we didn't see any moose, unfortunately. But um, so Alice was kind of, yeah, she was the inspiration and, and she was there. She was a picture of, uh, we had a moose on on our T-shirts and so on. But who knows? It's hard to get inside the mind of a moose. We, we don't know what they dream of. That We don't know what they, you know, what uh, we were actually, I don't think they really know what inspired Alice to to head, uh, head north from Adirondack Park. What's your advice for anybody who might want to do the ATA, the A2A trail? Well, my advice, certain, first of all, is that it was conceived of as a multimodal trail. And they, the A2A people didn't think that people would want to walk the whole thing. So there are sections, as I say, that are on roads. It's probably good if you can organize it to do those sections by bike and walk the sections and woodland sections and then maybe canoe. So I think um, you can walk it, but I think to get the, the the true experience, I think you might want to see if you could do some planning to 
to walk sections, to canoe other sections, to cycle other sections. That's the first bit of advice I would say. What, you know, what, what did you hope to accomplish um, in, 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 your, in your journey uh, and, you know, want to tell people and what can they do, you know? We wanted people, first of all, to know about the corridor, to know that there are organizations working to enhance the corridor, to, to uh, improve it, to conserve land. I like to think that, you know, after this, after the trek and because of the publicity and, and because of um, us talking to people, you know, if, if, you know, some percentage of people um, know about the corridor who didn't know about it before and who know that, you know, if, for example, they, they, they have a private woodlot or they work on a, they're part of a, a small local nature organization that connects to a larger uh, chain that connects to a larger avenue. That's, that's vital. Jamie Findlay is a storyteller for the conservation group Nature Canada. He spoke with David Summerstein. You can read more about his journey following in the footsteps of Alice the Moose in the new issue of Adirondack Life magazine. Listening to Northern Light right here on North Country Public Radio. I'm Todd Mo. And I'm Monica Sandreski. In just a minute, using a clothesline to connect old work clothing and us to the air, water, and soil. That conversation in just a couple of minutes. Then stick around after the show for Bird Note just ahead at 842. But first, Todd has a look at the weather for us. Winter weather advisories continue along eastern Lake Ontario, Jefferson and Lewis and Oswego counties including the communities of Boonville, Lowville, Watertown, the Thousand Islands, Fort Drum, Lake Effect Snows, uh, maybe another four to eight inches in the most persistent to snow lake snows by uh, late this afternoon. So plan on slippery roads this morning and probably the evening commute as well. The lake effect snow falling in relatively narrow bands. And uh, the Weather Service says if you're traveling in along eastern Lake Ontario, be prepared for rapidly changing road conditions and visibilities. And if you've ever driven through Pulaski, you know what that's like, where the uh, roads may be clear one moment and whiteout conditions the next. So use some caution as you're traveling through Jefferson, Lewis, and and. Uh, uh, Oswego counties this af- through this afternoon and uh, early this evening. Elsewhere, partly to mostly cloudy skies today. Highs uh, upper 20s into the mid-30s. Southwest winds uh, 5 to 10 miles per hour. Higher gusts at times. The Weather Service says tomorrow, partly to mostly sunny. Highs in the 30s. We've got clouds and 30 degrees right now in Canton. When you visit the Wild Center in Tupper Lake next summer, you'll likely find a clothesline stretched around the outdoor pond at the Natural History Center. This winter, artist Brenda Baker is collecting donated farm clothing, flannels, blue jeans, and T-shirts to create a community art installation. The clothesline project next summer will include hundreds of those articles of work clothing that will serve as stand-ins for the unseen farmers, gardeners, and producers in the Adirondacks and their agricultural practices. Brenda Baker says each article of clothing belongs to someone who has a story. She says the clothesline at the Wild Center will connect visitors to issues like the environment, the landscape, climate change, fibers, and local food. I love the the story behind a clothesline. This is a, this is also a story about sustainability. It's like it's it's probably the easiest thing you can possibly do to contribute to a warming to you know helping prevent a warming climate is hanging your clothes to dry. It's a simple practice that everyone can do. Um, so that's what I I love about it too. Clotheslines are are found all over the urban urban areas and rural areas and suburbia. They're they're just part of the landscape for many many communities. Although it's interesting, some communities in, you know, gated communities have, have rules about 
against clotheslines. My mother lived in a community in Arizona, one such community where they didn't allow clotheslines, which oh. I thought was ridiculous given that the clothing would dry in probably 10, 10 minutes or less there. So I think the whole idea of calling attention to the very simple things that we can do to help our, our climate and to help our planet. Are you so if someone has, say, a flannel shirt and they want to donate it, do you want them to write a note accompanying that that article uh, about the history of the, the piece and and who's so, yeah, so there are there are four or five drop off places uh-huh. right now and uh, that the Wild Center has organized. And these drop off sites each have um, boxes of tags. So there will be t- there are tags available to um, to fill out. Uh, if if someone were to drop off the piece of clothing without a tag, we could we could handwrite that note. Basically, we're looking for the name of the person who's donating the, the piece of clothing, uh, the name of their farm, the community that they live in, and a three to four sentence description of of how that piece of clothing is involved in their in their agricultural practice. So so yes, flannel shirts, overalls, blue jeans. You know, what, whatever the piece of clothing is that, that um, might be used um, in your practice. Have you done this sort of exhibit before or project before, Brenda? And I'm wondering, have you gone to other parts of the country or the world and, and done similar exhibits? So I've done several other clothes, clotheslines exhibits. Um, the, the one that, uh, that is most similar was in Reedsburg, Wisconsin, as part of a, an art exhibit called the fermentation fest so it's like a celebration of live culture and this is a rural community uh the installation was up for maybe just two or three weeks Mm -hmm. but i i went around to each community to the community to churches and libraries and these kinds of places uh to talk about the project in person of course i live in wisconsin and i'm doing the project in in upstate new york so i have gone and visited lots of farms but but i really really need help collecting the, the the clothing and getting people to participate um, in this. So the project I did in Wisconsin was a three-quarter mile long laundry line. It was really quite beautiful. It extended, it started in one forest and went over some rolling hills through some, uh, through a cornfield and through other, other fields and ended in another forest. And it was really quite beautiful because it, it sort of, helped define the, the contours of the land. Um, so that was, that was really beautiful. That was 900 pieces of clothing that were donated by the community I in think, that situation. Yeah, I think that's really interesting that we're not talking about a sort of a, a typical clothesline you might see in somebody's backyard here. You're, you're, you're thinking kind of large scale in terms of the final, final, uh, uh, final piece. Yes, this will, this will be a different kind of a, an installation than, than that one because uh-huh. This will be at the Wild Center, and it'll it'll wrap around the the pond right in right behind the Wild Center, right between the museum and the and the forest. Yeah, and it'll be right right along the path. So people will be walking along this path and looking at the clothing and look reading the stories, learning you know looking at the videos. Has your work um, uh, largely focused on rural issues or families or agriculture, uh, uh, the outdoors, those sorts of things? So I would say probably for the last three decades, I have been very, very interested in sustainability and what's happening with the climate and those kind of issues. And probably for the last 10 or 15 years, I've been doing lots of site-specific installations that call attention to issues of, of land and rural communities and food systems and those kinds of things in my temporary art installations that are outdoors. I, I, I tend to like doing installations oftentimes in settings that are that are not museum settings that are in the woods or in a in a farm field one other logistical question do they get the clothing back or this is this a permanent is this so a- that's, that's a good question so the, the the clothing that's donated will will most likely not come back i you know we can't guarantee that uh-huh. that people would get it back what i did in uh in wisconsin for the 900 pieces of clothing is that we Everybody who donated their clothing, um, you know, donated it knowing that they, that it would be given away as at a, we had a free sale. So on the radio, we announced the day that the sale, that the clothesline was coming down. 
and everyone in the community came and got to take their favorite piece. So, so um, probably I would say that I was only left with maybe a hundred pieces on that clothesline out of mm-hmm. 900. So the day that the installation ended, you know, people from all over came and took things that, that were meaningful to them, not necessarily the, the things that they, they dropped off. Um, so that was really a nice way to give the clothing back. Um, the other thing I did not mention is that each of the pieces of clothing will have tags sewn into the new tags sewn in in the back label, you know, to label the, mm-hmm. the clothing as part of this project. So there'll be a QR code in the back of each piece of sewn into the back of each piece of clothing. Uh, and that QR code will take you to the website, which will tell you where the piece came from and the story with the links to those videos. So that's another another way that the, the project will continue even after the clothesline has been taken down. Wisconsin artist Brenda Baker is collecting donated farm clothing this winter and the stories for the clothesline, food, fiber, air, and soil, a community art installation next summer at the Wild Center in Tupper Lake. If you'd like to help and want more information, by the way, Brenda is looking for volunteers to help sew the story tags to the clothing. Check out the website wildcenter.org slash clothesline. A little bit of music now. New music from Hamilton, Ontario-based singer-songwriter Tara Lightfoot. This is her uh, her cover of Last Christmas. This year, to save me from tears, I'll give it to someone special. Last Christmas, I gave you my heart. The very next day, you gave it away. This year, you saved me from tears. I'll give it to someone special. Christmas by Hamilton, Ontario-based singer-songwriter Tara Lightfoot. We are wrapping up the show for the day, but before we do, we want to remind you to check out the Festival of Trees going on now at Blue Seed Studios in Saranac Lake. Uh, they've decorated their woods, and you can walk through it and and, uh, and enjoy the time outside. Find out more from blueseedstudios.org. I also want to do a shout out to this t- stupendous team here at North Country Public Radio that help us with Northern Light every weekday. Kara Chapman and Amy Feireisel and Lucy Grindon, Emily Russell, Anna Williams-Bergen, News Director David Summerstein, 
Monica Sandresky. Catherine Wheeler. Catherine Wheeler. Todd. Catherine Wheeler. <laughs> Todd Moe. <laughs> and the whole team at North Country Public Radio. And you. Yes, you. For your financial support, of course, in our year-end giving campaign, but also your ideas, your encouragement, and just who you are that makes the North Country just such a wonderful place to live. We always want to hear from you. Reach out. Send an email to news at ncpr.org. I'm Monica Sandresky. I'm Todd Moe. Thanks for listening. Be well.